Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're happy to, to start day um, day two here with us. With um, we have uh, some great panels lined up today, and since I was president virtually the whole time, I actually get to use the gavel today, which is kind of thrilling and exciting. Um, so I'm happy to, to start us off today with the panel on state and local collaboration. So we have um, Karen Brinson Bell is uh, the executive director of the North Carolina State Board of Elections since June of 2019. She's worked on election administration since 2006 in county, state, and national roles. We also have Carmen Glenn is the senior quality and training specialist for the Mecklen County, North Carolina Board of Elections. Mecklenburg County has over 800,000 registered voters, and her career for the past 14 years has centered around making the voting process work for every voter in Mecklenburg County. We have Mary Beth Witzel Bell. Mary Beth has been city clerk for the city of Madison since 2006, um, and Tuesday has always been her favorite day of the week. Um, and finally, we have um, Megan Wolf. So I, everyone knows Megan. Um, Megan is our president of NASED, and she's the, the administrator of the Wisconsin Elections Commission and the state's chief election official. Megan was appointed by the bipartisan six-member commission in February of 2018 and unanimously confirmed by the Wisconsin State Senate in May of 2019 for a four-year four term. She is a fierce advocate for the more than 1,900 local election officials in Wisconsin, both within the state and at the national level, where she regularly reminds federal partners and her colleagues across the country about the unique challenges facing local election officials in a highly decentralized state. And us New Englanders really appreciate that. Um, as you all know, we're extremely fortunate to have Megan serving in a, as our current NASED president. So she brings to the same professionalism, preparedness, and integrity to that role as she does to her role as Wisconsin's chief election official. So I'm particularly proud to call Megan a colleague because she's just done such an incredible job under incredible pressure and scrutiny. And so we're so happy to have her here today to talk about local collaboration as well as the other panelists. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Michelle, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here with you and to uh, talk about an acronym that uh, the concept preceded the acronym, but when we came up with the, the words to match the letters, it seemed um, ideal. And so we're gonna talk about our hub's approach to work, which we then uh, determined meant help us, us being not the state, not the counties, but us as a team, uh, be successful and uh, and Carmen's gonna give a local perspective um, and I promised her I wasn't gonna make her talk more than me but I have more slides I'll just forewarn everybody um, so yeah I think before I dive into what hubs itself is about I, I need to set some context about how we got to that point um, hubs came about in March of 2020 uh, as a concept and then implemented in the early part of 2021. But um, from day one of being state elections director, I, I came into the role knowing that there was two ways to go at it. I could go in trusting everyone and believing we could do whatever we, you know, whatever we wanted to do was possible. And um, that the only thing that could happen would be that we would lose trust in each other or I would lose trust in them or they would lose trust in me. The other approach was to start out with zero trust and build it, but that was gonna be a difficult um, endeavor because that meant that you know we were working in silos and working alone. And um, so I took the, the first approach and, um, and from day one, we talked about being a team of 101. We have 100 counties in North Carolina and one state board of elections and we are team 101. Um, and it's been one of the most gratifying things is to to say that, but to to exhibit that, to actually put that into action, um, and to to build that together um, because we are in it together. And so it was just a mindset and um, an understanding of what a team is. Uh, you can say team all day long, but if you don't act as a team, um, then you're not one. And so we talked a lot about what our roles are and how we could support each other. 
just like a team actually would. Um, so now we rock, work around, walk around and, and do virtual meetings and we'll say, good morning, Team 101. We'll, um, the, a, a county received an award last year and they talked about that in their award speech and um, it, it's an exciting time. Um, we have rolled that into other uh, you know, sports metaphors. We have every other week, we do a statewide staff meeting um, that we also have some sort of training coordinated into that. Um, I give remarks to keep everybody up to speed um, on what we're hearing from the ISACs or from DOJ or from you know a Amy's uh, incredible notes keeping us um, you know, up to speed. And we call those huddles. Um, and we learn from each other. Uh, we have best practices from the counties. We have uh, new programs or, or efforts from the state office. And um, so that continues in, in this whole concept of helping us be successful. And so that's where hubs came about. Um, like I said, we had this idea in March 2020. Uh, I will say that uh, Deputy Director Trina Velez and I went to help a county reconcile and uh, as we were driving to and from that county, uh, don't put us in a car together because you don't know what may come from it. Um, and so we show back up at the, the state board office and a whiteboard is nearby and a few other folks and we start telling them our ideas. And next thing you know, the dry erase markers are out. The whiteboard is covered in circles and arrows and, and something that looked like a, a crazy mess. But the whole idea was how do we have folks enter act and work together more. And we started talking about gears and hubs and wheels and, and so forth. And we said, well, it's, you know, it's a hub. What is a hub? If, if nothing else, but a way that information and activity comes and goes. We've all, most of us have come in and out from an airport. Think about that. That's a hub of activity. Um, we have network hubs. That's what they do. Um, in ex exchange, and so that's how we decided to, to launch this idea, um, this approach to work as a collaborative effort where there's energy in and action out and vice versa, and um, we didn't want anyone at the state board staff, while they may be subject matter experts in their certain areas, they don't have to carry that alone. There are people on the front lines, our county folks, who know what it takes to implement and carry out those things that come from the state board so why not work collaboratively to to do that work and it had to be more than committees um, we don't think of it as a committee structure at all it is um, it is a team structure um, of collaborative work and um, it's a philosophy it's an ideology and um, and and it's it, it's just a constant now in in our approach to what we do um, and if you just think about the definition of a hub, it's why we went with hub over gear or wheel or <laughs> something. It's, you know, an effective center of activity, region, or network. So um, that's why it's stuck. And it, it may be a new concept of a hub, but that's our, our word. We developed the framework over the next few months. We created a steering committee um, of state board staff and, uh, and defined what these groups would be. We looked at the different subject areas that needed to work collaboratively, um, and those are listed. I mean, there's. Uh, it started out as 12. We've moved to 13. Um, we've shifted a little bit over time, but these are the base of them. And you can see, I mean, it's in-person voting. It's our um, voting systems. It's absentee by mail. Some of the ones you may not be as familiar with would be the concept of Team 101, and Carmen's going to talk about that because that's the hub that she's part of. Um, and then we started creating these groups and uh, d identified the leaders. Um, they are not chairs of a committee, they're leaders, and they're just the point of contact. Um, it's not for them to be the decision makers, it's not for them to um, have ultimate authority over their group, they just facilitate the group being able to work together. Um, we truly did draft members um, it, we, we did our draft kind of after the NFL would do. Um, <laughs> the counties completed a survey and indicated their areas of interest. Um, I won't say that it was ranked choice voting, but uh, they did rank their choices. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, um, 
And, and then the leaders of the group, we gathered and they had very clear instruction. We used a randomizer. And so, you know, on, on deck was uh, candidacy while absentee got to make the first round pick. And uh, absentee could then look and see that, uh, you know, here are all the, the folks from the counties. They didn't have to be directors either, by the way. They could be staff who expressed an interest in working in absentee. And uh, she could select as her first round draft pick so-and-so from such-and-such -such county. And, uh, and at that point, they were off limits to the others because we didn't want duplication. Um, we did not want uh, over-representation by a certain county. So the um, No Hub group has a duplicative county serving in that hub group. They may be on another group, but not that same group. They had to be varying of size when they made their selections. Um, so we didn't want all large counties in a hub and we didn't want all small counties. We didn't want necessarily everybody to have years upon years of experience. They had to also pick people who were rather new to the field so that we got a broad perspective and uh, work together. And then um, we have folks in advisory capacities um, as you know, they might be, for example, uh, since our PIO is here, there's someone who connects to a hub uh, from the comms team so that they are constantly in communication and aware of when a hub might need a press release to go out that relates to a subject matter, or um, if there's a lot of public records requests coming in around a subject matter, then uh, Pat and the comms team can, can coordinate with that hub to get information so that he doesn't have to identify who are the subject matter experts, he already knows who to go to. And it's that hub um, that can be that institutional knowledge that carries forward and, and can also advise at that time. Uh, this is sort of a diagram that we put together uh, to illustrate for those who need visuals of what a hub looks like. Um, and, then, um, and then we just outlined for the groups um, just we did a, a starter guide so that they could understand what the objective was going to be. Um, and that's a collaborative group where assigned contributors will plan, develop, and manage the ongoing implementation and execution of an identified election subject or program. It's pretty broad, but we wanted it to be that way. Um, and they meet routinely. They establish a task calendar, and they put that into our, our universal calendar. Um, they have core aspects that they work through. Um, as we modernize our election management system, they will be the expert around that module um, to help build that out and to identify the requirements. They'll be testers in that. Um, when we have legislation or litigation that comes down that changes some aspect, they have identified the forms or the manuals or, or whatever that need to be updated to reflect those updates. And then we've created channels and teams for them to be able to communicate and uh, email distribution lists if they want that um, as a way for them to be in constant communication with each other. And the goal in the end is, you know, we do have change that happens in our profession, but this way we have some continuity of knowledge. Um, and also, you know, you, you've got varying perspectives, so it's also building knowledge as we go. Um, and I mentioned that it's, you know, there's a lot of different uh, size and and experience and so forth, but that gives us a broad perspective to um, succeed in these subject areas. Ma'am? <laughs> Good morning. All right, so I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, Team 101. Uh, Team 101 created its project list with helping us uh, be successful in mind. Up. Um, our mission is to spearhead efforts that advance the county and state board of election goals prioritize the needs of county directors and board members, and to work with other hubs to produce the desired deliverables. Our project list, um, it seems small, but it took a lot. So starting with the board member manual. The board member manual is complete. We started meeting um, in March, I believe, of 2021. And it's complete, but it's in legal being vetted, <laughs> uh, the director's manual. So the director's manual is taking a little longer. We're in the mid stages. We hope to have that completed in the upcoming months. Um, our next big project, as a trainer in one of the larger counties in North Carolina, I'm excited to talk to you about our next project. The Election Resource Center 
will benefit all 100 counties upon completion. The ERC will serve as a one-stop location for all policies and procedures, forms, numbered memos, election law, and all things election. It's important for a trainer to have up-to-date information. Why? Because we got to give that information to our poll workers, right? And when the poll workers have that correct information, then we have the confidence of what? The voters. All right, so I'm excited about the Resource Center. I can't wait to log in and look at it um, and plan my training around the information in the center. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, some of our achievements, uh, things that we completed. At the beginning stages, we recognized that many hubs inside of our hubs were needed in order to um, complete our project goals. Our next step after creating the mini hub, which uh, consists of one or two members in the group, our uh, Trina, which is the head of our hub, would we talk about different projects and then one or two members will sign up for it. Hey, I want to be a part of that, uh, that project. And so after we created our mini hubs, then we needed a workstation. We needed a place where we could store our documents our meeting agendas, notes, project ideas. And then we came up with cre uh, the creation of the Microsoft channel. The Microsoft channel allows us to uh, post those project ideas. Also, it allows us to work in unison. Um, so it was great just to have that. I, I will say one of the drawbacks that we found out about the channel was it's so secure at the <laughs> state, um, Karen has everything locked down, that county employees like myself, we, I couldn't sign in. <laughs> so um, that was good to know because we were able to pass it on to other hub groups if they decided to um, start a channel. Our uh, procedural checklist. Our procedural checklist will assist our county uh, directors and staff with step-by-step -step procedures um, to reach their desired outcome. The uh, election day list, we came up with that list uh, particularly for new directors to provide them with step-by-step -step, a calendar approach leading them up to election day. The hand eye recount uh, checklist um, we created that for staff so that they could um, plan prior to receiving the sample count from the state board, what they needed to put in place to get that uh, sample count done. And then lastly, MAT. Um, and MAT stands for Multipartisan Assistance Team. We put together a checklist starting from the hiring practice of those folks that we hire, to go on the MAT team, um, including payment of the MAT team, and then their overall responsibility, which is to assist our elderly and our disabled voters when filling out uh, voter registration forms or requesting an absentee by mail. I am um, actually looking forward to uh, remaining on uh, Team 101, which is helping us be successful in North Carolina. Um, under Karen's leadership, she talked a little bit about the hub, but she didn't give herself the credit that she deserves. The hub for county workers, um, you, as you know, directors, they always meet at, with the state, and then we get that information last. But when we are able to hear it, then we're held accountable. We're all hearing the same thing when we meet on that bi-weekly um, hub meeting. The information we receive is always relevant, uh, especially in our county being one of the larger counties, especially around uh, training. It's always good to get that information. The hub gives us information on court decisions and then um, we find that, okay, we've trained one way, but now we gotta go back and train another <laughs> way. But it is good to just have that information on a bi-weekly um, bi calendar, especially when training. Um, with that being said, 
it is overall great to get information. Why? Because information is power. And when we can provide that information, again, going back to the poll workers, it makes the election process smoothly. And so I'll turn it back over to Karen for here's what's being said. Thank you. We're almost done, Wisconsin. <laughs> um, I, we did, um, I, I, you know, we're here for NASA, but we did get recognized by the EAC for this. And when we submitted, um, we, were, we had actually been surveying to find out you know, how people felt about hubs and what could we improve upon. And, um, and since it had, you know, was still in its infancy and we wanted to improve, and um, we received two comments back that we have shared um, because one, we were flattered, but two, we felt like it, um, it gave a good sense of what the hubs have really helped to accomplish. And so one of our county directors, um, Scotland County is a small county down along the South Carolina line and, um, and, and would probably, you know, one of the things that's come about from this is that we have over 60 of our counties represented in these hubs. And so there's a vast participation and a lot of these may not have ever been the go-to county in the past. And now they're at the table. And so Scotland was probably one of those that sometimes would be overlooked because they're kind of small, um, a more rural area. And yet she's been very active. And so she said, our hubs group helped design absentee forms, audited the election setup, created candidate filing packets and candidate filing guide. All of this was done in plenty of time for the counties to prepare for the filing period. I was very proud to be part of the process that brought the state and counties together to provide timely documents and assistance. And so, you know, we're spreading the workload too. I mean, we can't, uh, there's, there's a lot to do and, um, and, a, and a short time to get there as the song goes. Um, and so, uh, you know, and then we've worked with um, Austin Burrell and uh, some of his uh, classmates at the Harvard um, Business School and in the Harvard Innovation Lab and um, I still don't quite know how Austin found me but he's uh, he's diligent and and reached out to me on LinkedIn and I actually read the message um, and uh, he said I'm working on something and you're you've been brought up and so when we did this survey, he gave us some feedback after working with us. And he's working on a collaborative effort called Roundtable. Um, and he says, Roundtable has been working alongside SLTT agencies to better understand how election workers communicate and collaborate across jurisdictions. The NCSBE's hub program presents the most innovative and replicable model we've observed across the nation. The blend of bottoms up ownership and top down uh, support, I can't even read this far away, uh, empowers <laughs> election workers that are closest to the action on all processes to collect, codify, and share best practices in real time. Um, we were overly flattered that that's how Austin has viewed us and appreciate his efforts to help us be better in that approach. Real quickly, I'll tell you what we've learned. Um, you know, it's still in its infancy, but it's, it's shifting a philosophy, an ideology, and creating change. Um, it's also understanding that we are a team, that we each have roles, but it's an amazing opportunity. Um, Commissioner Hovland and I were talking about this morning about why he participates in, in uh, election center classes and so forth, because he gets to meet with people at all levels of elections. And having this approach to work has meant that I get to work alongside Carmen. Um, I, I'm not, you know, okay, I'm the state director. That's my role, but look at what she's doing in training folks. And I need to hear from Carmen to understand what it is that I need to tell legislators or others about the reality. I mean, it's been a few years since I've been in her shoes, but I can, I can communicate with her and, and that's so key. Um, we've recognized that not everyone's been taught to be a leader. And so we've had to do some coaching through that. Not everyone's understood that they have job security when others know information. So we've had to coach some people through that. We've had to pivot, um, you know, Carmen mentioned the technology. We've had to think about the structure a little bit and, and how that would go. Um, we have had to emphasize it's communicate, communicate, communicate. 
Um, I love how you said information's power, and that's what we want everybody to know. And then I mentioned earlier, it's not just say that you're a team, but be one. So thank y'all. Well, that was really excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think there's some things we can certainly take back from that, so really appreciate that. Um, so thank you, everybody, uh, for, for being here. And uh, thank you to Mary Beth from the beautiful city of Madison for being here today, too. So um, Mary Beth and our clerks around the state have a, an election coming up on August 9th. And so I know it's a really busy time, and I really appreciate her being here. And I also really appreciate you as a city of uh, uh, Madison residents and all the things that you do for us. Um, I think Mary Beth and her office are really a shining bright example of election administration here in the state of Wisconsin. So I'm just really proud to have her here uh, next to me today. So, um, so uh, today we're gonna talk a little bit about what we do to coordinate as the state and local election administrators here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so the first picture I have is a, a bottle of hand sanitizer. And what on earth does that have to do with collaboration? Um, well, it actually has a lot to do with collaboration. Um, and it starts in 2020 um, during the pandemic, um, where I think that we all found ourselves in situations we couldn't have possibly have imagined or anticipated. And we certainly didn't have the supplies, the personnel, uh, to navigate those challenges. And so I think we all found ourselves needing to, to step up, not because we were required to, not because the law mandated it, not because it was part of our job description, but because it was the right thing to do to figure out how were we gonna get what we needed um, to be able to run that election. And so we worked really closely with our local election officials to understand the needs and to really adjust on the fly and understand what do we need. And now, granted, the sanitizer that we ended up procuring and getting out to the polling places didn't look like that. Uh, what it was was a bottle of high-proof vodka with a Windex spray top that went to our jurisdictions. Uh, but you know, we we identified a need working with our local election officials, and we found a way to coordinate together uh, to make sure that folks had what they what they needed to be able to run that election. You know, as we were just talking about and reminiscing about, we didn't even know if we were gonna have an election in April of 2020 until the evening before. And so uh, we had to really work together closely um, to be able to do that. And the next slide um, I think is gonna, you know, show why here it's even more difficult than maybe some places to collaborate on those things. And that's because Wisconsin is the most decentralized election administration system in the country. Um, and we run elections at the municipal level. And I know you've all heard me say that, you know, a thousand times, but it's such a huge part of our story that instead of having counties, we have 1,850 cities, towns, and villages that administer elections. Um, and we have our larger jurisdictions like Milwaukee and Madison, um, but then we have over 1,200 of those that are townships. So these could have as few as 50 registered voters uh, in their township, um, and that clerk might only work five hours a week, and they might even work out of their home because they don't have a town hall. And so coordination can be really challenging to make sure that we're all staying on the same page and that we're producing information, materials that's useful for both the city of Madison and for a small township to be able to utilize when they're doing outreach to their voters or whatever the challenge uh, might be. And I don't know if you had anything to add about that part of it, Mary Beth? Yes, because the city of Madison and the city of Milwaukee have very specific needs um, just based on our size and the number of voters that we have. and. Madison being a college town, we have particular challenges because of people moving. And those same challenges are not necessarily a part of what would be faced in a small town. But as the Wisconsin Elections Commission meets with clerks to hear all of our concerns and our needs, I keep hearing Megan say, 
we understand we have to make this work for both the small towns and for our large cities. So we all feel heard. And then Megan has the challenge of trying to balance things to make sure that all of those needs are met. And a lot of that comes down to listening and not just saying, oh, well, that's just Madison and Milwaukee. They're an exception to what is needed throughout the rest of the state, but trying to make sure that she's meeting the need of 1,900 uh, clerks throughout the state. So, you know, I think collaboration we found, again, I think that hand sanitizer example, the working with the National Guard to staff polling places, all the things that have to happen in 2020 really helped us to recalibrate on just how important that coordination was. I mean, we always coordinated, but I think now more than ever, as our states and our election administrators have really been in the national spotlight, it's even more important that we're communicating and that we're on the same page about all things election administration. And so I think we've really had a renewed commitment um, to ensuring that we're creating materials and uh, information that the local election officials are able to utilize as well. Um, so one of the, the big things that we do, I would say one of our major functions actually as an agency is training for our clerks. But we actually, we train the clerks, but the clerks train the poll workers. And so our, our role in this is to train on the statewide voter registration database. Um, so we have, you know, 2,000 clerks, which means with their staffs, we have over 3,000 users of our statewide voter registration database. And we have hundreds of training modules um, that clerks can access on their own time to understand and figure out how to utilize the statewide voter registration database. Uh, but we also do regular things like webinars uh, with our clerks. Uh, webinars is not a new 2020 development here in Wisconsin because we have so many clerks. Uh, we've had to meet virtually always, right? Because there's really not a room big enough uh, for all of us to gather at one time to do training. So we've really always leveraged uh, virtual training with our local election officials. And so we, we pair these pre-recorded trainings for some of these topics with webinars where we actually have a chance to hear the questions and the concerns from the local election officials. And a lot of times we'll do those webinars two or three times in the same day so that clerks that might work part time might only be available after hours that they're able to join uh, when they're able to. And one of the things that we found here in Madison is that we often need to turn on a dime to meet a need. Uh, for example, during the pandemic, the request for absentees just skyrocketed and it was way beyond anything that we had the capacity to handle. And so we had to reach out to the state and say, we need to quickly get librarians trained to process absentee requests. And then the state acted very quickly to get training set up via the online module for librarians to quickly complete the training and get access to use the state system. Uh, so, and I know we're not the only municipality that was reaching out to the state saying, help us quickly, we need this right away. But uh, they handled those requests with grace and uh, were very polite about it and quickly got access to other city employees to help us meet that demand. So clerk communication, clerk communications, this is one where um, it, it might not seem like a big deal, but I think it's actually one of our most prominent ways that we coordinate with our local election officials. So when you have 2000 local election officials, again, you can't all get in the same room. You can't all jump on a call um, because not everybody's going to be available at the same time. And so we do a lot of communicating with our clerks by memo. We, we really love our memos over at the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Um, but the thing that I think works about that is that we're able to put together communications for our local election officials that also serve as public information, right? Because if we're communicating to the clerks, it needs to be understandable, it needs to be clear, 
And it also needs to be transparent to the public about exactly what it is we're all working on together and what sort of the guidance or the information is that's being shared with all of our local election officials. So we developed a protocol with our clerks many years ago about sort of the priority that we give some of our communications. So for example, if something is um, timely attention, so it's not um, something that's critical, but it's something that you need to pay attention to soon, we'll post that to our website and then in our newsletter, which we'll talk about, we remind clerks that it's out there. If something's critical, then we're gonna post that to our website, but we're also gonna send out an email that says, hey, you have this clerk communication, it's on the website, you need to go look at it right away. Um, so there's a couple of different you know, priority levels that we can assign to it. But again, I think the thing that works for us with the clerk communications is it's not only a communication to our local election officials, it's a communication to the public as well. And it really does provide a great deal of transparency in how we coordinate together um, as election officials. Anything to add to that? I just agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so communications. Um, I think this is something that's really been growing and um, not to, to embarrass my, my staff, but we have an awesome public information officer who's here today, Riley Vetterkind, and he's done a great job of uh, producing tools and information for our local election officials uh, that they're able to share at the local level. Um, so the social media plan is something that we just refreshed for this year, but it's something that we do prior to each election um, so that our clerks have a grid, essentially, that has a calendar as we lead up to the election, and then it has text for a post, and then we create images that they can utilize and share on their own social media. Um, and we've also done things like uh, Riley recorded a webinar, uh, so clerks who might not feel comfortable using social media, that they're able to uh, get a tutorial on how that works. So we try to make it as easy as possible for all types of clerks around the state to be able to share information with their voters at the relevant times. We, of course, also utilize this content as well. And so if a clerk would rather just share our content, they can do that too. Uh, but we like to give them all these tools so that they, they don't have to guess, they don't have to worry about are we getting the date wrong uh, for this particular notice about registration, uh, that it's all right there for them to be able to utilize as we head into an election. And it also has been helpful that the Elections Commission staff have put together a communications plan template that we are able to customize at the local level and make sure that we have a plan on how to respond if there are any emergency situations or controversial things that pop up on election day. So just having that as a starting point was incredibly helpful, particularly during the pandemic to make sure that we're prepared. And so we know that we can always turn to the Wisconsin Elections Commission and their website to find tools and resources that we can use to be successful at the local level. So this is a new thing that we're doing in coordination with our local election officials. So starting in 2020, I was doing weekly media availabilities where Essentially, how I view these as it's an opportunity to educate the uh, media about how an aspect of elections work. And so we'll cover things like how our ballots counted, how our absentees process, how do we conduct list maintenance. And each week we cover a topic, um, and that's sort of the price of admission to then ask us any questions that you would like about elections generally. And so this year, we actually started adding a clerk to those conversations. And I'm, I'm just so grateful that there have been clerks that have been willing to be a part of those media availabilities that we've been having each week um, so that they can offer their perspective about how elections are run at the local level. And so we just did one last week where we talked about list maintenance, a really complicated subject where there is so much coordination and partnership that happens between the states and the locality. Um, that it was really great to have the uh, clerk from, this is actually the clerk from the city of Superior, which is one of our northernmost uh, municipalities. Uh, she was able to participate in that uh, to give her perspective and to answer questions from the media. And so, um, you know, we view these again as, as educational opportunities for the public, for the media, uh, but also a resource for other clerks 
um, if they're looking for information to share with the public about some of these complicated processes that they have a resource that they can point to. Another project that we're working on this year is a election education video project. And how this came about is uh, we, uh, there was the idea that we work with schools and um, social studies programs to make sure that uh, high school juniors and seniors had some information about how elections work. And so right now we've been creating these videos uh, utilizing, we have a narrator who you see here on the screen, and uh, she's kind of conducting like a game show with some young people around the state about various topics on elections administration. And so the goal of these is that uh, they'll be shown in the social studies classes, uh, both this year and hopefully into the future, but that they'll also be good approachable content hopefully engaging content, uh, maybe even fun content, which I know is an, a word we use often in government, uh, that people can share in social media uh, to educate people about some of the basics about election administration. So this is something that we hope to launch um, later this summer um, so that we can begin utilizing that. But clerks did play a huge role in the development of this um, we talked to them about our communications programs, about some of these ideas uh, to make sure that we're on the right track and that they think it would be useful content for them as well. Um, the newsletter. This is a new thing that we've been doing too uh, in the last year or so, uh, but essentially the newsletter goes out to clerks every other week and it highlights some of the things that are happening in the office. It highlights some of the projects that we're working on and it reminds clerks about resources. It reminds them about maybe we have an upcoming commission meeting. Uh, maybe there's an upcoming legislative hearing that has to do with an election bill. Um, so it gives them all sorts of information and resources that's relevant to that week. Um, and this replaces an email that we used to send that just kind of reminded them of clerk communications that were posted. Um, but I think it's been really well received uh, because again, it helps to keep us on the same page. A lot of times we have resources we put out, but because of the high level of turnover amongst clerks, um, somebody might not know about it if they come on board a few weeks after we release that resource. So it's a good way to remind people about relevant resources as they come about. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that one. It, they have been very helpful and it's a good way to review what WEC is focusing on as we at the local level are preparing to train our poll workers and mention areas that we ought to be focusing on in the upcoming election. And it also gives us a chance too to share talking points sometimes. So let's say there is something that's been in the news, right? And uh, we wanna make sure that the clerks know about the information available to answer that type of question. It's another place that we can give them those resources um, so that they can also answer questions about that topic. And this is available uh, both to clerks, we email it directly to them, but you know, as with everything, we also post it to the website for the public. Um, communications toolkit. I actually think a couple of years ago, I shared the initial draft of this um, with, our, with NASAD, um, but we developed a communications toolkit that has all sorts of things that clerks can use when they're responding to a crisis or any kind of media sort of um, uh, situation. Um, so what it has is it has draft holding statements, it has draft t talking points, it has draft press releases, um, social media posts that somebody can use uh, to respond to situations. So the situations are sort of broad. Uh, let's say there's some kind of technology issue and you're not quite sure yet exactly what caused it or what you're gonna do about that. This social media or this toolkit provides them uh, with a, a draft holding statement that they could use while they're figuring out the issue and then drafting the final communication. And we actually even have a tabletop exercise that goes along with this that we did with some of our local election officials so that they had an opportunity to practice those things. So if you had this type of scenario, what are the things you're gonna do 
for communications to respond to it. And I think it really gave people some confidence to be able to answer those questions um, if, if they did indeed come up. I find myself referring to it as well because it's just, you know, it's nice to have some basic building blocks when you're in those situations. Um, correcting the record. So this is something I hope is useful to clerks as well and something that we developed after 2020. Um, but we keep a running list of frequently asked questions or let's say we're hearing something where you know there may be some kind of theory or misinformation um, or a rumor about an election process. Um, you know, our goal is never to shame people for bringing those to our attention or to, for having those questions, uh, but we want to make sure that we're answering them and getting out good information. And a lot of times the claims that are made require a lot of work, as I'm sure you're all familiar with. It requires a lot of work to look at the data, to figure out exactly what question somebody's asking and to find a meaningful answer. And so we post all of those questions and then the detailed answers on our website um, and then we also make that of course available to the clerks to use so that when they're getting those questions because a lot of times if we're getting that question you're probably getting that question too about uh, for example there were a lot of questions about why do we have inactive data in our database right why don't we have why don't we delete uh, an inactive record, why do we keep that history? And so some of these FAQs deal with topics like that that are not just being directed at us at the state but might be directed at a local official as well so that they can refer to that, refer somebody to that, um, to our site uh, for that answer. And our poll workers have found those FAQs <laughs> very helpful because they often before election day start to worry about questions that will come up and whether they know the full answers. So I know they have used that as a resource that's been helpful. And then uh, clerk advisory committees. Um, so this is something that we've been doing for quite a while now um, and they evolve, right? So sometimes we'll have an advisory committee on one topic and then it's not needed anymore and we develop a new one, um, but kind of like um, uh, our colleagues here were, were discussing, it allows these opportunities for our office and for clerks to coordinate on all sorts of topics. So right now, for instance, we have a clerk advisory committee that focuses on um, communications. We have another one that focuses on um, security. We have one that focuses on training because again, we really need that feedback to make sure that we're hitting the mark. I think we've found, and you've probably all experienced too, when you have a bright idea at this state that pertains to the locals and you just plow ahead with implementing it without asking, it's not gonna work well for everybody, right? It's never gonna be a great idea. And so these really allow us an opportunity to have that sounding board, to get a really well-rounded group of local election officials together to advise us. And we learn so much during those meetings about things that we thought were a great idea that you know just aren't gonna work and that we need to tweak. And so we're really appreciative to the clerks for giving us their time uh, to help make all of our, uh, our products and tools that we produce better. So that is it for, for Wisconsin. Um, thank you very much and we can turn it back over to Michelle. Excellent. Um, thank you for that presentation. It was really great to hear um, the ideas that, or the programs that you guys have. So, because I think one of the benefits of NASA is we always learn from each other. Um, so now we have an opportunity if we have a, a few minutes for questions. Does anyone have any questions for the panelists? I mean, I I always have questions. So. Um, so my question is for the local election officials. For us as state election officials, is who we are in the room, what do you think that um, we could do better? Or is there anything that you think is missing that, as a, that, that the state could be helping you with more? I don't think there's anything that's missing. I know that if there's anything that we need at the local level, I can reach out to Megan directly and she's on it. Uh, I try not to bother Megan directly, uh, but uh, sometimes I do. And we always know that we can call the help desk at the elections commission, even if it seems like 
an unreasonable request because we need something immediately. And they clearly view us as partners in election administration and are part of our team and willing to help us out. And so it doesn't feel like it's locals versus the state. It's that we are one team working together to serve the voters. Okay, um, so I agree with what she said. Um, I don't think it's anything uh, to add to that, actually. We, if we need anything, we can always reach out, uh, help uh, put in a help ticket. Um, but we really don't have to do that. Why? Because we have the huddles. The huddles will answer all our, of our questions that we would normally have. So again, that's a great tool um, that we have and that information that we receive on that biweekly um, rotation is, um, is key. Deborah, did you have a question? I do, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, sort of as a new director, especially with an office that is under-resourced and locals that are under-resourced, maybe you spoke to this a little bit already, but I'm interested, especially for the local officials there, what piece of, um, uh, what of these approaches that you've discussed has been the most effective in terms of too much information versus not enough information? Like that's a constant balance that we're trying to find and strike. And I wonder if one of these pieces really stood out to you and, and made a difference in your work. I'll like actually speak to that. Um, it's never um, not enough information. We, because our county is so large, we need it. We need all the information we can get from the state so that we can uh, make sure that our poll workers have that information. Um, we have over 3,000 poll workers every single election. And if it's, say, presidential, then that grows to 5,000. So information is key. So it's never a uh, little bit. No, we want it all. We want all that information. And it, it, it helps. And with that, we can tell uh, 2020, I was listening to what Megan was saying, but in 2020, actually, it was about the best election we ever had. We had no issues. Um, it was great. And actually, you know, I don't ever wish the pandemic to come back, but I want those same poll workers to come back. It was fantastic. We have uh, 195 precincts. Um, some of our precincts, the registered voters in that uh, precinct is about 8,000. So um, yeah, information, we love it. I would agree. If we don't have a lot of information from the state, then we at the local level start trying to figure out what to do on our own. And then we don't have any consistency because we're each figuring things out differently. And so there is no such thing as too much information from the state. Hello, thanks everyone. Um, I have a question, I guess more for the local clerks. Um, as the state and the coordination of local and state has evolved to improve communication and coordination, how have you, if at all, adjusted your clerk association or just clerk only communications to try to sync up with what you're doing with the state? Or ha has that been part of the process at all? Or have you sort of kept those communications separate from the coordination with the state process? Our state association of clerks uh, will often send out reminders to look at a communication that had come out from the state, but those clerk communications are very different from what you're hearing from the state. So they're more, look at this uh, new information from the Wisconsin Elections Commission, or look at the new information from the Wisconsin Department of Revenue, but our clerks association isn't giving us guidance on elections. We look directly to the state for that. I have a question. Um, this is Suzanne from South Dakota. We definitely have much smaller counties than some of these states, but 
maybe someone else can speak to this. How do you get some of the counties that are smaller with um, very small staff and um, older, ours are actually auditors, how do you get those older generation involved in some of these communications like the Facebook, the social media stuff? We really struggle with getting everybody to buy into some of the things that we're trying to do. You know, I don't know that we have a perfect solution. I think that's a great question. You know, with for us, I mean, over a thousand of our jurisdictions are really, really, really tiny. And they usually are uh, an older person that's essentially volunteering to serve their community, right? Um, and so some of them might not have any comfort with technology. Um, but I, what I've learned is to never underestimate them. Um, so when we go to their clerks associations and talk to them about these things, so a, an example is going to a .gov email, right? Uh, we had been encouraging our clerks to go to a .gov email, which is hard. It's complicated and uh, it can be expensive and it can be technically demanding, right? And uh, we went to their associations, we talked to them about it um, and how, it, why it was important, resources that were available, our help desk that was available to help them with that transition. And I have been blown away by how many of them have figured out how to do it, right? I'm so proud of them and the fact that they've figured out how to do it, that they've prioritized this. Um, so I, I really think that if they're given the tools and if you make it really approachable and um, try not to penalize it in any sort of way, uh, that the clerks really are looking to be able to be in compliance to make sure that we as a unit are secure. And so I think if you give them the resources and make sure that you're available to answer their questions, uh, that a lot of them will feel comfortable to try something that might otherwise be outside of their, their comfort zone. So we've seen a lot of just tremendous success with our locals uh, embracing some of those technological uh, initiatives. And I'll be quick before Amy takes the hook to us. Um, I mean, a couple of things that I would add to what Megan said, it, we, having the huddles means that we can highlight that, you know, different size jurisdictions are doing different things and that's help because that's, it, it's constantly highlighting things. Um, having, um, we have field support. We have our, our states divided into what we call eight districts. Um, has nothing to do with congressional districts or anything, but those those folks work for the state board, but they are on the ground to support the counties. And so whether it's social media or processing absentee ballots or whatever, that's what they go in and they, they do, and they'll handhold for that purpose. Um, and so one of the other things we're gonna do is we're, like I said, the, the hubs evolve. And um, Pat has said that he wants to have a comms hub so that they can do that very thing, take those counties of varying sizes that have come up with some of these best practices so that we can create templates similar to, to some of the things Megan and, and Mary Beth talked about um, so that we can can give them those tools. Because you're right, um, we've got one county that's um, less than 2,500 registered voters in one person office. She can't do everything. Um, but, but if we can give them some of those tools and that's, that's what we've had to do. Can probably get in one more question if anyone has one. Anyone? I was going to ask about the varying sizes and things like that. So you already got that one. Um, well, we'll just thank our panelists now. And, you know, th I think this is a great opportunity for us to hear about uh, collaboration, and that's what we're all about. And we all want to learn more about it. So we thank you for your presentation.